Welcome back, 1570 AM WNST. My next guest is Nestor J. Aparicio. Nestor, welcome in. Well, it's always good to be with you. This is, uh, I would say to my wife, I, I, I like hosting. I think I'm a good host. I'm a better guest. You know, I'm way You're better guest. guest. You're fantastic you ask, you ask guest. the questions. What do you want to know? Well, you know what? I, I, I haven't caught up with the Liars Luncheon yet. I was out doing some other things. And so I'm going to rely on your expertise. You were there. You saw the questions. You saw the answers. And just your overall impression of how the conference went. Well, you're a new world, man. I mean, you don't even watch the games live. You know what I mean? So, like, I can't expect you to stop your day for something called the Liars Luncheon. By the way, just so you know, and I want to take full credit for this because I have not. And there's a lot of things that I, you know, I let go and just say, I don't need credit for that. I don't want any bows. I'll, I'll play the humble role. I will not play the humble role in this. I name the Liars Luncheon. It's my name. Oh, I coined it. Nice. I told Bo Smolka the other day because he was using it and they're all using it. DaCosta calls it that now. So that is so it's now on. And if Kevin Byrne were anywhere, Kevin Byrne, it used to piss him off. Oh, my God. Why? I would call him and say, when's the liars lunch, you Kev? And this is in 97, 90. I started calling it that. And it's Eric's fault, just so you know. Uh, so the, the, the real story is Eric and I and Phil would get together back in the day and they would have a day. In like February, you know, after the Super Bowl, I I didn't go to the combine until first combine I went to was in 04. Okay. So, and you know, until then, in those years, 99, 2001, I mean, Phil left around four or five. Right. I mean, right around when he left the 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 event would happen. But the event would happen now. You know, first week of April, they would do the a pre-draft lunch. And I have all the stacks of the, um, the books that Kevin Byrne used to hand us with all the R lads and Joe Bushbaum. And I'll give them to you if you want them. They'd be fun to look through and see what people thought of Ed Reed and what they thought of Todd Heap and what they thought of Haloti Nada and all that stuff through the years. But the event before the event happened, I would go either to Eric, Eric came to my house one time down when I lived downtown, we would sit and have coffee and I would get my sporting news book out. I would get my R leds Athlon, all my mm -hmm. draft books out when they first would come out in February. And Eric would say, get your book. Phil would say, get your book. And we'll circle some names of some people to keep an eye on. Some people we're looking at. So you're, when you're on the radio, you know, you're not naked. So look this up. Marte Jenkins, capital T, M-A-R-T-A-Y, Marte Jenkins, whatever year that was. And I should Google it's 99, 2000, 2001. I was led to believe by both Phil and Eric that Marte <laughs> Jenkins would be taken. And I went hard on Marte Jenkins for two weeks before the draft. Marte Jenkins sat there to pick 170 for whatever the hell it was. The Cardinals or somebody took him. And I, I went to Eric. I'm like, I'm never going to trust you again. I, I just never <laughs> going to trust you again. So all these years later, I started calling it the liars luncheon at that time, knowing that they would never tell you the truth, no matter okay. what Joe Ortiz. And I got into it on a uh, on on Tuesday after we're walking through, we were talking about politics, baseball, all the usual is kids oh. stuff that Joe and I talk about. Cause I don't ever see Joe. Right. All right. I see him at games a little bit, but we don't sit and talk with masks on the whole deal. And we were walking along. He's like, I'm not going to tell you the truth. Why would I tell? I don't tell. I don't tell my wife. I don't tell anybody the truth. Hey. And I'm like, good, good. That, that's fine. That's why that's the liar's luncheon. So let's not call it anything other than what it is. So you ask how it went. I, I think um, first things, Joe's getting better at this by a lot over the years. Eric is getting much more comfortable with himself and being – uh, a teacher. You and I talked about this last week with Kevin O'Connell, right? When, when I was down at the, uh, at the owners meetings. Yes. Um, and John, Eric, Joe, all the coaches, whether it's Wink Martindale or whether it's the new guy from Michigan, uh, I have to get used to Mike McDonald. McDonald, right? McDonald, right. I, I, I haven't met him yet. Probably never meet him <laughs> at this rate, but um, you know, all of these people are teachers and um they, they command a room and John's way better commanding a room with players and the young ladies that were at the facility the other day on an educational mission than he is sometimes with the media after a loss on Wednesday. And um, I would say they're at their best when they're teaching. And I don't know. I'm at my best when I'm writing, I think. Right. Okay. Even more so. than. But we all know, put the cook in the kitchen and and. 
put the cook in the kitchen. And when Eric DaCosta is explaining rationale and philosophy, and that's the difference. A lot of the other reporters are asking him, so what do you think of the wide receivers? And what do you think of the tight ends? All of my questions are philosophical. Philosophical about why are eight other general managers and owners trading their first round draft picks away? And you st- and do you still value it as much as you ever have? And I got a hell of an answer out of him. You know, as long as we're, as long as I'm running the place, we're going to build through the draft. Nice. Good answer, Eric. You know, so that, that's what I was trying to get out of those guys in asking the questions that I, that's always the way I go at it. I go at it, not low hanging fruit, especially off season. I'm on a nerve center dive and I want to know philosophy. And I think the liars luncheon, provides a lot of that. I, I really do. And, and it, they're going to lie to you about whether they're taking this kid at center in the, th- in the third round or whatever. But when it comes to philosophy and the way they process things, they can't lie. They're like Bashadi. They're, they're too honest and, and, and to some degree and afraid of how honest they might be giving away state secrets about how they evaluate players and what's important to them. Marte Jenkins, I looked it up, uh, wide Go receiver, ahead. kick returner from Nebraska, Omaha, in the 1999 NFL draft, sixth round, 193rd overall. So yes, sir, you were you were played. You did they uh, take that little kid Ab Abner D- 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 Derek Abney? Do you remember that? They they took a little Derek Abney. returner yes. from Kentucky who they really did. never made it to the field. Then yep. they took the other little guy. They had another little kick returner Game that was going to replace. Yamon Figures, remember that one of my all time fa- figures. figures. One of my all time favorite names. We've had some. We've had a jaw. We've had a Yaman. We've had a lot of Kyles and a lot, you know what I mean? We've yes, had a lot we of have. names because we we're at the point now when the old Orioles, because it's opening day, um, favorite Oriole names. I mean, as a kid, I could give you 15 great Oriole names. Drungo Hayeswood, Sergio Robles, Tom Chopin. You know, we had great, uh, 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 how about, um, uh, 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 who was the Chico Simone? Oh my God. There's a better name in the world than Chico Simone, right? How about Luis Aparicio? Oh, uh, see, people they're, like they're, saying that. Like they like saying Dennis Colazzo. There, there's a know? name there, right? There's Absolutely. a name. All time name. But yeah. How about uh, I remember from Nebraska, I am hip. Isaiah Moses Hip. He was a running back. I, I am hip. Am hip. hip. <laughs> H-I-P-P. So there's there's some good names out there. My favorites are the Michael Jordans that come along, like the, the, the point guard from Penn that was, you know, is Michael Jordan. And I'm thinking, man, that's a tough one. It's the no. same thing with the, you know, David Bowie changed his name because his real name was David Jones. And right. there was already a David Jones. He was that's in the right. monkeys. That's right. That's right. <laughs> hey, how about Barcavius Mingo? That's one of my uh, latest uh, talk about recency bias. Barcavius Mingo is a, is a phenomenal name. Didn't play up to his name or his draft position, but nevertheless, the name was, was memorable. The national championship team the other night uh, brought me back to some sleepy Floyds and, you know, some good nicknames out yeah, there. But yeah, but when yeah. it comes to the Ravens and uh, and and drafting and the Liars luncheon and where we are, I would say this was one of my favorite things and one, and my favorite relationships. You know, I mean, the reason I'm still have a relationship with Eric and Phil Savage and Joe Douglas and these, you know, these, these scouts, uh, Andy Weidel, these people that are all over the league uh, is because I took the draft seriously in the beginning because we sucked. We were four twelve. We were four yeah. twelve again. Then we're five and 10 and one. And then we're, That's and true. then Billick's coming in and we had to get players and the way Ray Lewis and Peter Bulware and, you know, Jamie Sharper and Kim Herring and John, Ogg, how can I forget John? Ogg? All of that taught me that if I wanted to cover football the right way, the draft was essential. It was, it was essential. And these three weeks here, uh, I tend to leave Eric alone, leave everybody because they are they're out there moving the board around, trying to figure out every they talked about this kid from Michigan that broke his leg, right? A, a, a Jabo, right? Yeah, David Jabo. Um, and and they, 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 they talked about him. Dennis, how do they evaluate whether he's a second, third, fourth round pick? They have to talk to every doctor, not just the kid and the potential and the upside and the injury and bring him in and physical. That's a lot of work to put into a kid that may go 13th on the board before you, you know what I mean? If somebody else evaluates it that way, I don't think that'll happen with, with him, but 
who knows, uh, with, a, with a blue chip guy, Anthony Poindexter would be a great example from 20 years ago of a guy that got injured. And, yeah, and but, but it, Poindexter tore all three ligaments. And back then, that was unheard of to come back. But the, 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 and I remember Phil Savage saying, if you never – plays a down in the NFL it was worth a pick he was that good of a guy and they took him in the seventh round and he never he tried hard but that knee was never the same but technology was it's much better today than it was 20 years ago he's a wonderful man Anthony oh, Poindexter. That's what they he, said. he's worked uh, years I think at the University of Virginia I mean he might be yeah. some other places now yeah. there's a lot of guys hey I I went out and had a beer with Wally Richardson a couple of years ago, he's a big shot at Penn State when it comes to recruiting. And uh, and, you know, so some of these guys have gone back to their universities. And that, that's the beauty of all of this. All of these years when you're seeing guys um, that you saw on the draft day and their kids are getting drafted wow. and their kids are in the league now. Um, and, you know, remembering names of guys that are running franchises now or guys who are out in the draft like Mike Vrabel. I had a chat with Mike Vrabel at the I haven't talked to him. Wear my my Titans blue. <laughs> when I had breakfast with O'Connell, I got up and Vrabel was standing there, and he's just standing there alone. And I figured, yeah, I'll say something to him. And um, I said, but you see Schwartz? He tell him I said, oh, hey, you know Schwartz, I'm from Baltimore. Oh, I said, dude, I remember sitting in Schwartz's office with Marvin, watching film of you when they were going to draft you before you got taken ahead of you. Know, and he said, man, you got old. You don't look that old. And I'm like. I'm old, dude. You know, I mean, that's how far back I go. And I mean, I respect the draft. I love the draft. I wouldn't miss the liars luncheon. Um, I do think that if you parse through want, 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 and questions about this kid or that kid or the jokes about, you know, we love the quarterback class, draft some quarterbacks in there, you know, move us along. So there's a sense of humor about all this for all of us in the know as well. I, I look, I think the world of Eric and Joe have for 20 years, trust them implicitly as a fan on, really really understand that you and i love the draft and we have fun with the draft it's a whole it's like talking about cars with you right like you just have forgotten so much about it and um they're so good at it and when they get up and command the room for an hour and then joe goes back room and starts taking questions about individual players and he can just rattle off like kuiper like you know what you see on nfl network or dan jeremiah or any of that that sort of mastery of this and then trying to get it right later in the month when the bullets are flying, you know, trying to get that value right and trying to get the right player, but everything they do from now to then is about getting the board, right. Making sure they have the right people on their board. Back when uh, Billick uh, came in, uh, Nestor, since you brought coach up, he, uh, one of his first meetings for the players, he, he showed him, he said, look, I've got a five-year contract and, uh, I know when Rod Woodson came in, he was like, man, that, that means we're going to have to work. He's not going anywhere. Of course, now John Harbaugh has a three-year contract. He's not going anywhere. What does that signal to the players, uh, both the holdovers and also the incoming players, Ness? Well, it signals there's no mutiny going on. I mean, John survived several of those, right? Like the end of Flacco. Um Ed Reed, Bernard kind of, Pollard, that, that kind of a thing. And, oh, sure, on all that. And, yeah. you know, and and this goes back, you know, one of Billick's biggest challenges was controlling religion in his locker room. Sure. There were two different factions of, of, quite frankly, Jesus and chaplains and prayer and, you know, like trying to – and Brian's relatively agnostic on all that just to say, hey, man, we, you know, we got to get along here. We're trying to win chapels. the game. We're trying to yeah, win the game. We got to win the game. Let's pull yeah. it all together here, you know, like – as it all goes. Um, and that's John's job as the, the ship captain. Right. And um, there's no question as to who's in charge, right? None. There's no question as to where the bar is. There's no question in my mind. And, you know, and I got some insider. See when Bashadi dogs me in Palm beach and doesn't meet with me, I then go call 10 people in his world, and find out what the hell's going on. So I've done that this week. Sorry, Steve, I'm a reporter. Um, and apparently Steve's dug in. Steve is enjoying watching games, pouring wine on whatever boat, on whatever island, wherever he is. He doesn't feel compelled to fly in. I don't think Steve feels like he needs to be the savior of Baltimore. I think that's gone now. I don't think Steve even feels like he needs to be popular in Baltimore because he's not here to hear all the ish that goes on about all of it. But I think the Ravens, now that he's a billion, billion, billionaire sitting on a boat somewhere, the only toy he's got left 
and he cares and he wants to win and he's competitive. And I don't think he wants to Good. ditch it for $3.2 billion at this point Good. and not have this toy in his life. And then watch from the outside as it potentially gets decimated by whoever comes in. Um, at this point, he can decimate it himself if he wishes to. But John Harbaugh and Eric DaCosta are not. They've been his guys all along. This is the way he runs things. I'm trying to think of the last person in that building that got fired. I mean, Dick Cass left on his own. Kevin Byrne left on his own. I saw Roy Sumroff. These are all 30-year employees, 27-year employees that came off the boat with Art or into the boat. Um, and now Sashi Brown's going to come in. And, you know, I've met Sashi a couple of times. He's been relatively chilly to me. Um, he's going to be a different kind of leader than Dick. I mean, Dick Cass, Kevin Byrne, when these people leave your organization, they leave giant, giant institutional holes to be filled. And I don't think he wants that hole being filled on the football side. I think Steve goes to enough of these owners meetings and sees the young hot shots and sees the former intern running the jets over there and says, I'm okay with that. I picked the one I wanted to run my dealership and I got Eric here and I still got Joe. The guys that were important to our operation and have been institutionally important to our operation since he bought the team are still involved in that football side. He's only picked one coach and we've picked two actually picked Jason Garrett first, but we don't talk about that around here. Nope. Um, um, it's like that never happened. <laughs> you know what else is like never happened? You want to play a little inside? It's almost like Steve Bishotti never chased Mark Shapiro in Toronto to be the president of the team. And Mark didn't want to come home and, and run football. He like running baseball. It's almost like that never happened in the last six no, months. I got it. Yeah, but uh, but it might have. Um, as to who would take the gig, right? And John takes the gig. Eric DaCosta was in that meeting, right? Like, uh, if I go back, I think Vince knew some of, there were seven, Ozzy, obviously, right, that's still in the building, Steve, people that were in the, the hiring crew that hired John are still there with John. So I think it was very important to Steve when Eric was in there in 2008 saying, can you live with this guy? Because in 2022, you might be neighbors. You, you, right. you, you, you know, this is going to be a blood brother, a brotherhood that they promised Brian and then threw Brian out. Brian was always told he was part of the, the foundation of what was going on. And then he found himself on the outside. Since then, the football side has been completely John, John's coaches, John's way. And then Eric's way on players and Ozzy and, and George Kikinis. And that has managed to work. I mean, I, I have never, ever heard anything inside about John liked that guy, but Eric didn't like that guy, but Joe wanted that guy. And this, this guy didn't work out because they have failed draft picks every year. I, I ask sure. Eric about that. Uh, one of the questions I ask Eric, the second question I asked in the Liars Luncheon was, what do you learn when you draft Yaman figures? and Derek Abney and Ryan Sutter and go, the, the, the linemen that didn't make the team two years ago that they just got rid of right away, that they dra they put all this into drafting a kid, bring him in, and by August, they got three Not out right. of the ten kids that they just know aren't going to play for them. And that's that's a weird – that if you had to go hire ten people at Coons Ford right now, six months from now, as good as you are at hiring people – three out of the 10 might still not be there. And that's probably not weird, right? On a normal hiring process. You only have to be right 51% of the time to be successful. Nestor, I think that's what great organizations know. I appreciate your time as always. A lot of fun. You wound me you up. On. See that? You got me <laughs> I gotta, all I, I can't even bring you back down again. We're running out of time, but uh, you do such a great they job. They still but... lied. It was all over with, and I'm sorry you asked. <laughs> Good stuff. I'm sure I'll read about it uh, all over the place on. So social media and whatnot in terms of what they said and what they really said. And, you know, the, the, the truth, the lies and wherever the gray areas. <laughs> but the one thing I said to, you know, I said this to Joe Ortiz on Tuesday, I said, people ask me who you're going to draft and stuff. And I'm like, I'm good with watching right. the movie play out. I'm yeah. good at speculation and who's well, good and, you know, reading. And, and I get my, you know, I, I will be up on the draft and know who all these people are <laughs> when the time comes. But there's a part of it where like, you guys eventually show your hand and then you bring these eight or nine or 10 or 11 kids in. And then, as I said to Joe Flacco, kid, if you can play, you won't need me. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, you know, Flacco uh, 
also had a hand in drafting Tannen Doss, the wide receiver. Supposedly that was a story and that didn't work out uh, too well for Tannen Doss either. But look, they, I know they have an idea of who they want to take, but the way the board plays out is unpredictable. So I'm sure they're predict they, they have different scenarios in their mind about which direction they're going to go to. They always do. You know, one thing that was really heartening to me is I said on the air, maybe with you or somebody this week, because I was talking a little draft uh, and it all runs together. But I, I said they have the 14th pick. They're going to use that pick if the seventh best guy is still true. on the board. Very if true. they're at 14 and there are three guys they feel like they could get at 25, then they'll they'll back up and they don't right. have any idea as to how that's going to go. But I do know they do a fire drill every day there right. for every sure scenario. They it's they fire oh, drill it, everything for the next three weeks so that that possibility is there that if if on 14, this guy or this guy will take him. If not, we'll punt because these are well, three guys we can get and pick up some more picks. You'll punt as long as you have a willing trade partner. So if they don't have a willing trade partner and they have to turn in their card, then they have to make a decision on the three or four guys that are sitting there that can help that, that can help their team the most. And like that time when the only guy they had on the board was Ed Reed. And they just said, they said, Hey, eh, he's we'll a safety. Him. We'll take a shot at him. Right. And, um, uh, look, you know, Terrell Suggs, we talked about that in our last, last segment, guys drop all the time for different reasons and they'll be prepared to, they'll be prepared. That's, that's one thing you can't fault them on. Uh, their preparation is second to none. They've got this thing dialed in and they'll be able to do whatever the situation calls for, whether it's well, best player available I, or trading back. I'll leave you with this because we've been lengthy in this one, but um, the, the, I was online earlier today and I saw, Hall of Fame classes of 23, 4, 5, 6, 7, and like who might the five be and when some of these guys are going to meander. Marshall Yonda's name was not on there, but Suggs was. Yeah, and, you know, 25 or 26, he's going to give a speech. Hopefully his, his ass isn't hanging out like it was in the locker room half the time. But, um, but you know, hopefully – he represents well. You know what I mean? He I was a he guy was. here who was my least favorite Raven because I dealt I with that. him. And all the, but he's going to go to the Hall of Fame. He really is, right? Like he's going in before Yonda. He is. Yeah. No question about that. He, I don't, I don't, I don't know that there's any, if I had to make the case for him, yeah. I guess I could go make the case for what a great football player he was. And certainly the afterlife of picking up the ring at the end, he might come back and play for the chiefs again next year. <laughs> uh, you we, never, we, he, we may be calling him up. I saw Damato Pecco at the super bowl. He's still on. Look, if Weddle can come back, that's exactly I think right. That, that's going to be a Jim Palmer moment for somebody. If you remember when Jim Palmer came back at spring yeah, training absolutely. and got absolutely. lit up, there, there's going to be a moment for somebody out there. I don't think it's Calvin Johnson. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think no. it's some of these people, but somebody's going to come back based on Weddle. I don't know who it's going to be. I would agree. Great stuff as always. Nestor, keep doing great things. I appreciate you. Hey, appreciate you. You got to take care. There he goes. Nestor Aparicio here on 1570 AM Baltimore positive WNST. We'll take a quick break and come back right after this.